Hello everyone and welcome to this week's Tourism Teacher Talk. Today we have Ron Sonia who is in Laos at the moment and he's going to talk to us about mice tourism. Hi Lauren. Hello Dr. Stanton. Hi. Um, so can we start off and can you just tell us a little bit about yourself and where you're working and what you're doing at the moment? Well, I'm a French national and I've been living in Laos permanently for over 13 years now. I did uh, my uh, studies in tourism management. First, I started in France with a, a diploma, so it's a two-year degree. Then I took a, a gap year and uh, I worked basically to save some money because I wanted to go to study in uh, Australia, which I did. I went there in 2001 and this is where I got familiar with Southeast Asia and Laos. Why? Because I was a student in Brisbane and over there, I was in the class with some uh, fellow students from Laos, from Thailand, from Malaysia, Indonesia, etc., who were uh, scholarship students, so hosted by the Australian government. And uh, after six months uh, over there, I decided to return to France to pursue a, a bachelor degree because I realized that with uh, just a, a diploma, I wouldn't progress in my career fast enough. I was quite ambitious. So I decided to return to France. And uh, when I returned, part of my uh, bachelor degree was actually to spend one semester abroad to do a, an internship, a six months internship. So when I returned to France, I contacted my friends all over the world and I asked them if they knew about a place for me to do a, a, a training. And my Lao friend in Australia told me that his brother was actually working for a newly uh, launched uh, local agency uh, managed by French people who started over there. And uh, I applied and like this very easily, quite rapidly, I discovered Asia in Laos for the first time in 2002. So for me, uh, I've known Asia by the small door, by, by Laos, spending here six months already uh, 19 years ago. Wow. After that, I returned to work. Yeah, it hooked me enough to, to make a living now. <laughs> and uh, after this first experience of Asia, I returned to Europe and I did my the rest of my studies, uh, master one, master two, first doing Erasmus exchange in, uh, in Norway, uh, the same year as Laos. So when I returned to France, it was the Euro in Europe. And uh, I went to uh, Norway where there was no Euro. So for me, the year 2002 is a no Euro year. <laughs> and then I uh, kept on studying and I did my master's degree in tourism management in the UK, in Bournemouth, so the south of England. And I graduated there in November 2004. After that, I uh, was looking for a job. And uh, around uh, Christmas, I was called by the regional head office of the DMC I did my internship for, uh, who was offering me uh, a job in Vietnam. So basically, I accepted because it was a great opportunity. And I started my career uh, in Vietnam in January 2005. So I've never been really uh, unemployed, I would say. And uh, since then, I've been in Asia, Southeast Asia precisely. First three years in Vietnam to start with. And in January 2008, I moved back to Laos in a way, uh, and I've been there since then. So I'm very happy uh, living uh, in Laos. And uh, the first uh, three years, I, I, I worked for a regional DMC, a large uh, uh, network of local agencies. I was the head of the country. So imagine, in 2002, I was a student, and in 2008, I was the GM. So I was leading a team of uh, over 60 people. So just, just for anyone who doesn't know, what is a DMC? Our DMC is basically the acronym for Destination Management Companies. These are local agencies that organize the trips for foreign visitors. So wow. they are all the operational logistics for all the tools that are actually uh, designed and operated by either tour operators or travel agents uh, outside of the, the country in question. And after two years for me, I was a little bit tired. It was the end of 2009, and I decided to take a, a gap year, uh, take a break from the travel industry, and I moved into uh, hospitality. I did the sales opening of a small boutique hotel for almost a year. And uh, during this time, it gave me the opportunity to think about my future. And basically, I realized that I really love the travel industry, and I would, wanted to run it my way. So uh, at the end of 2018, uh, 2010, sorry, 
on the 10th of October, so 10, 10, 10, we launched our own company. And when I mean we, it's because I did not start alone. I have uh, business partners who are uh, Laotians. So my uh, company today is called Laos, like the country, mood, like in the mood for, and travel. So Laos mood travel. And we've been operating for over 10 years now. Wow, what a fascinating career you've had. Thank you. And very busy. <laughs> Yes, definitely. Yeah, wow. Uh, so, I'm just having a look at my question here. Um, so, you work in the field of MICE, M I C E. Um, so, for anyone who isn't familiar with this acronym, can you tell us what is it stand for and what? Yes, MICE is actually a, a, an acronym. Eh? So, in the business, we have this little joke that it's not the plural of mouse. So nothing related to rats and all these kind of uh, things, but it's more actually about group business travel. So M stands for meetings, basically. I for incentive travel, so all the reward trips of the of the sector. The C is more for convention and conferences, so large events usually in halls and uh, uh, big size, but can be any size actually. But often it refers to big size events. And the E depends; it can stand for either exhibitions or events or corporate events so it's an acronym for group business travel very specialist uh, because uh, when you want to enter this field you have to have a certain knowledge and understanding how these uh, people and how trade works so it's very very specific and usually uh, agents the, the travel planners they are uh, experts and it's very rare that a company is expert in both leisure and business travel very often these different entities. Mm -hmm. But for us, it's part of the portfolio of things we like to focus on. Because when we started Laos Mood, basically, we wanted to focus on what we like. And one of the things we like is actually promoting Laos for uh, the mice trade, and especially the eye of mice for incentive travel. This is one of our specialties. We are one of the very few to believe in the potential of Laos for this market, for this very, very niche market. And we are happy this way because there is less uh, competition on this uh, segment. In preparation for today's talk, I was actually doing a bit of research um, and I started writing an article. I didn't quite finish it, so I can't share it with you yet. Um, but I was doing a bit of research into mics. Um, and I was reading that actually it's grown more in the Southeast Asia and the Asian Pacific region than anywhere else in the world. Would you say that's... So, and yes, yes, absolutely, because we are in uh, countries where the economy is quite strong. Uh, we experience uh, growth, I would say, much above world average. So there is a need for people to travel within the region. So we are part of Asia, Southeast Asia, Asia Pacific as well. So there mm -hmm. are plenty of uh, companies and organizations at large, not only uh, private sector, but who travel for, for, for business. So for us, there is the local market. Maybe we talk about it uh, later because in times of COVID for us, it's kind of uh, uh, helpful, I would say. But otherwise, when international travel is possible, definitely there are some uh, regional movements. So for instance, uh, a Hanoi Vietnam-based uh, uh, company uh, wants to do a meeting uh, in the region because they have partners in Thailand, in Malaysia, in Singapore. So they need a convenient place to, to meet together. And uh, they pick uh, places of interest for them. Can be Laos or, of course, any destination uh, of their like. So city, countryside, beach, etc. Okay, great. Yes, yeah, it's, it's very interesting. And have you, have you noticed a, a big growth in the business that you've seen since you started? Uh, yes and no. Um, because Laos is a very niche destination. So the potential will only pick up from the moment there is a high degree of uh, visibility, uh, which is not the case because Laos is always under the radar of these mice mm. planners or corporate planners. And access also uh, is very crucial. Uh, today, uh, in the world of before COVID, at least, people wanted everything fast, going fast from A to B, if possible, direct flights, cheap prices for air tickets, and all of that, which Laos doesn't really have. Because yeah. Laos is uh, connected regionally, but not much beyond. To give you an idea, the longest uh, scheduled flight we've had in the past was between Vientiane, the capital of Laos, where I'm based, 
and uh, Incheon, the, the city of Seoul, basically, in Korea, which is just under five hours, which was the biggest, longest flight we ever had uh, from Laos to the rest of the world. The rest is much closer, like Hanoi, 50 minutes, Bangkok, one hour, Singapore, two and a half hours, etc. Mm -hmm. et so air connectivity, especially for mice, where people come for a very short period of time, usually two day, one night, three day, two nights, if it's regional, or five day, four nights on the spot from long haul, from Europe especially. Usually people are taking that on their working time. So they are not here on holiday, holidaying. They are really working. They spend some time in uh, meeting rooms. They spend some time uh, doing things on the field, which is related to their work. So they hardly come for, for more than, let's say, five nights. Very rare. Very rare. Yeah, interesting. Because Laos doesn't scream out at me as a uh, business travel destination. But I'm using there, there obviously is some business travel that takes place there. No, uh, La Laos uh, definitely lives from uh, leisure tourism. Uh, mice is just one of the specialties, but some uh, partners and stakeholders believe in the potential of, uh, of group business travel. Uh, we have, for instance, a, a Crown Plaza hotel that opened uh, three years ago in Vientiane, the capital, with almost 200 rooms. And I can tell you that their meeting rooms are very busy with the local market for the moment, because Laos mm -hmm. is closed. But before, there were regional meetings held basically every day. So Pullman entered Laos market with a resort in Lomprabang, the north of the country, with 123 keys, and they have fantastic meeting facilities. So um, we have also budget hotels, uh, sorry, boutique hotels with 25, 30 rooms, 40 rooms that have meeting capacities. So Laos tends to, to be perfect uh, fit for small and medium-sized events. Mm -hmm. For events, it's difficult to, to cater with that because again of air access, which is one of the biggest restrictions. But for us, as we target more boutique exclusive for people who've done everything before, and we want to push the, 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 their comfort zone and reach uh, new horizons, Laos is the perfect uh, Asian destination for them. Yeah. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see where it goes in the future as well, obviously things might uh, change quite a bit when tourism starts. Up exactly. And one of the key uh, changes that will happen here will happen sooner than later. It's uh, Laos is getting uh, more and more connected in the region and the uh, railway is being built to connect uh, China, the south of China and Singapore through Laos. So for many years now, the, the railway has been under construction and we expect that the launch ceremony will be held here on the Laos National Day. That is to say the 2nd of December, 2021. So just in a few months from now, they are really working on finalizing the train stations. And uh, from Kunming, which is the main city in southern China, uh, through the Laos border and then onwards to uh, Thailand, uh, Laos is going to be part uh, of an integrated area. So definitely there is going to be more and more Chinese interaction uh, instead of by plane, airplane, overland. Wow, well, that could be a big game changer because China is... Outbound, uh, tourism destination in the world now, I believe. I mean, yeah. Yes, uh, domestically, everything has restarted. In China, everything is back uh, to normal, almost, I would say. Uh, yeah. Domestic air transportation is uh, higher than before COVID because mm -hmm. the Chinese who used to go abroad now they travel domestically. So the local market is, is really powerful uh, in China. And uh, once uh, traveling abroad will be okay again, I guess uh, everybody will see them back. Yeah, look, I know. I know lots of countries in the area are dying to have the Chinese tourists back, and we're all dying to leave as well. Yeah, everybody wants to go somewhere. I mean, uh, local tourism, slow tourism is great, but it's kind of to me uh, by by default. People need to feel a sense of exoticism. They need to 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 explore, see the world. You know. And uh, we too, I mean, uh, Laotians uh, or people based in Laos, we want to see our families again in Europe, in Australia, in America, in Asia, wherever. Yeah. And, uh, we, we look forward to these announcements, but I'm afraid it will not be for, for, for this year. I'm afraid. Hmm. Okay, so moving on to the next question. Um, yeah. One of your specialisms is incentive travel. But can you tell us a little bit more about this? Yeah, incentive travel is uh, our core specialty. Basically, we work with what we call incentive houses. These are travel agents uh, for us in Europe, 
especially who are specialists of tenders. So basically, our clients, uh, these uh, incentive houses, they chase corporate business. Can be for pharma companies, can be for insurance, can be for automobile, petroleum, energy, any field basically. And they participate in tenders. So they are always looking for exciting new destinations around the world. And I'm here, I'm the head of the marketing basically for, for Laos Mood. And I'm here to promote Laos as a suitable destination. Just to give you an example, yesterday we had the sad news that we just lost one tender, one bid to the Dominican Republic. It was from a Belgian agency for six groups of, uh, no, sorry, four groups of 60 people for November 2022. So we are always working much ahead in advance in anticipation because handling groups of 50, 60, 70, back to back or whatever it is, uh, it takes some time and some planning, budgeting, etc. And uh, we went through a tender process and the other destinations that were in contest were Jamaica, were Finland, uh, were Malta, were French Guadeloupe Island in the Caribbean, Laos, Bali, and we managed to reach the, the final, but sadly and regrettably, we, yesterday we were told that we lost to, to the Dominican Republic. Oh, such a shame. Yeah, it's a very lengthy process. We yeah. started from very far behind. And one of the reasons why we lost, because we always ask, uh, what can we improve for next time, you know, and we want to learn as well. Uh, losing is no problem, but learning is better. And one of the two reasons, uh, two main reasons, the client really uh, um, wanted to have a kind of all-inclusive uh, option at the hotel. And this is very typical of uh, resource in beach destinations, where you have liquors, alcohols, and these kind of things. In Laos, it's very not the tradition. And uh, we try to, to incorporate this in our budget, but this increased significantly. And the second reason is because the brand of the client was not present in Laos. So they, they had no peers, no local you know, people working for the same company. And this was a little prejudice. And uh, finally, they opted for, for, for the Dominican Republic. So the idea of working in incentive, basically, we compete globally because we receive the same brief as any other destination in the world. So there are kind of uh, trends, I would say, especially it depends on each market. But if we take the examples of French market, for instance, that I know quite well, there are some hot destinations for mice and incentive, especially. Like for instance, just before COVID, Oman in the Middle East was one of the hottest destinations in the world for mice. It's incredible how, ma how much amount of business they receive from France, Spain, and Germany, and all of that. Because wow. it's a that. Oman, yeah, because it's a safe destination uh, in the region. It's very exotic. They have a very uh, big diversity of landscape and experiences. High level of hospitality, hotels, but not only resorts on the beach in the desert with camps and everything, and a very strong national airline. So they have direct flights, which is very, very convenient. In six hours straight, you are from Europe anywhere to uh, Muscat. So yeah. advantage uh, for them. Uh, so for, yeah, it can be quite uh, surprising, but it's our uh, one of the biggest competitors we have. Where else? We have also Costa Rica, Colombia, Colombia also, because uh, it's safer than before. And they have a high degree of uh, diversity also with the coffee region, with the Margarita Islands, you know, and Curaçao and all of that Caribbean side in the north, Bogota and all the colonial cities, UNESCO also. Very appealing uh, Colombia these days. Costa Rica, because it's a green destination and a very leader in the ecotourism uh, field. So the same, they have dense jungles, they have beaches, they have colonial uh, parts. So all of that makes them super appealing. And uh, also in Asia, Bali is always a good idea, somehow for people who haven't. <laughs> so, Everyone loves Bali. <laughs> everybody loves Bali. So it's true that for us in the region, it's a big competitor. And also Myanmar, before uh, the crisis, uh, Myanmar was very, very hot, I would say. But now it's going to be complicated for them for, for some time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so tender protest. Yeah. Incentive is very key. We are given a pre period of travel. We are given a budget. We are given a, a little bit elements of brief. And we have to show the muscles. We have to show who we are, what we stand for, and how good we are. And uh, basically, uh, in a tender process, a typical one, 
uh, we have about 10% chance to, to make it. Why 10%? Because usually the corporate client asks three different uh, incentive houses, and these three different incentive houses, they each propose three destinations. So why we have basically one chance in nine, so about 11% of success. This is a, a tough battle to exist on the incentive travel market. And do you write these bids yourself or do you have a team specialist who do? How does that work? Yeah, we, we, we work together. We are a small uh, pool of people now and uh, we work together. So one person, we brainstorm and we throw ideas in a synoptic format, so in table. What shall we do uh, arrival morning? What should we do for lunch? What should we do for afternoon? Blah, blah, blah. Once we have that, we work on, on the quote and we try to see if we fit in the budget. And then we design the program. So once the program and the quote are, are, are done, we send that to the agent and then we support them with pictures, with information about timings, about technical information about the hotels, fact sheets and stuff. Mm -hmm. Uh, we try to follow up what's going on <laughs> so it's not our um, uh, we cannot influence anymore uh, it depends really on, on the agent ability to persuade the, the clients to come to laos more than anywhere else around the world yeah so talk about, um, a bit more about laos. Yeah. Um, i visited back in, i think 2011 and i have great memories such a beautiful such a country beautiful um, but, but most of the tourists, the tourists the time, the worst, the worst. drunken backpackers we wanted to go tubing and partying, and oh my goodness, it was so dangerous. Um, you know, yeah. jumping in a river, insanely drunk, and and uh, winging in and going out to the bottles of whiskey in their hand. And um, is the country still like that? Does that really happen there, or has it changed? It has changed, but it's very cyclic because uh, this is phenomenon is very limited to one specific town, which is called Vang Vieng, which is uh, uh, located about 150 kilometers north of the Lao capital, Vientiane. And uh, it really depends on how the local uh, government or mayor enforces the law, because th there are laws about consumption of alcohol, making noise, use of drugs, you know, those kind of things. But they were relaxed for quite some time. And maybe you came during the time when it was really easy, I would say. Mm -hmm. But a few years later, because of the bad publicity that you mentioned now, uh, it was damaging the, the image of the country as a whole. So the local authorities were asked to stop these kind of uh, practices. So now Bang Bang is a lot more clean or cleaner than, than before. You don't have these uh, behaviors uh, anymore. You can still find, but not generalized, I would say. So today, the tourism in Laos is more toward uh, a nature, culture uh, type of uh, visit. Uh, mm -hmm. Laos is covered by uh, two-thirds, 68%, by forest. So Laos is quite green. Green by forest, green by rice fields, green because of uh, tropical weather, basically. So um, people are tempted to go and venture over there. They want to do trekking, they want to do mountain biking, they want to do kayaking, they want to do rafting. So Laos is quite suitable uh, for that. So for anyone who is uh, in the mood for it, no matter how old you are. We also have occasionally guests who want to do a homestay, they want to go walking, they want to meet uh, ethnic minority people. So all of that is definitely uh, possible. But the nature, the DNA of uh, Laos mood is more of a... Uh, um, a social, more of a human, more of a cultural uh, identity. Uh, mm -hmm. The reason we exist is to connect the visitors and the local host communities, no matter if they are Laotians, if they are ethnic minority people, or if they are also expats, so people who are foreigners and who live in Laos and who have interesting things to, to talk about, to show, to, to share. So we are uh, boasting the network of contacts we have here in Laos, to introduce and to open doors that remain close to the people who don't pay enough attention or who don't spend enough time. Because uh, um, it depends which market we look at, but there are very specific specialties. For instance, the US market sees Laos only through the focus of Long Prabang, which is a heritage town in the north of Laos. And they say that. I love Long Prabang. Yeah, it's, it's lovely, but uh, it's kind of uh, restrictive, I would say. It doesn't reflect the whole of, uh, of Laos. But for people who come from large countries, especially like Canada, Brazil, 
USA, Mexico, you know, China or whatever, uh, the notion of time and distance is quite different. So these people, they come on holidays in the region and they hardly spend more than two, three nights in Laos and only in Lomphoban, which is a pity, in my opinion. Mm. But for, with a strong focus on Europe, uh, mainland Europe, I would say, uh, France, Belgium, Germany, Spain, Italy, UK, etc. Uh, people don't see Laos uh, the same way. The average length of stay we handle here in Laos is about 12 nights. So it's almost two, two weeks uh, home home, basically. So it's kind of long tours. And uh, we try to market ourselves like that as specialists of Laos and not just some specific parts of it. Mm -hmm. We country from north to south, definitely. Right. And how has Laos coped with the COVID pandemic? What has it been like to live there during this time? Very well. Very, very well. We are one of the few places in the world that has had officially no casualty. Nobody died from COVID right. in, uh, uh, since uh, the pandemic started. So over a year now, obviously. Yeah. We only recorded 49 cases as a whole. Imagine, in the whole country. And, That's uh, incredible, isn't it? Yeah, it's it's kind of uh, striking, striking, but it's true. We, we, I mean, we live here, and uh, the social media are everywhere. Four uh, G, five G, everything you want here. People communicate, no matter the language they use. We have no big filters of uh, uh, on the on social media, so basically you can say what you want. Uh, and if there were cases of people who would have died and everything. But uh, to be honest, more than half of these cases are not community spread. They are people who came into Laos by the official means, with a visa, with a special flight, and who were in quarantine. And more than half of these 50 people, let's say, were uh, diagnosed after day five, day six, day eight, day 10 of quarantine. So they didn't really spread within the community here. Laos experienced a lockdown in April last year, one full month of lockdown. And then gradually the country uh, reopened basically uh, and all social gatherings restarted again uh, after the summer. So we could go into a, a wedding or a special place closed indoors without much restriction because there were no co records of uh, community spread of COVID in Laos. And still the case today. So I think so schools have been open. Do you have to wear masks in Laos? I have one because uh, in some places uh, it's appreciated, but it's compulsory nowhere, basically. It has become customary in the domestic flights. If you go within Laos, uh, in the north, in the south, from Vientiane, where I live, uh, it's not compulsory, but I would say 90% of the people who will fly uh, on an airplane, they will use a, a mask uh, by their own initiative. But uh, everybody has uh, the hydrogel, you know, and the mask, uh, and people are cautious. But nothing compulsory because, again, no, no, no cases. COVAX yeah. arrived in Laos uh, last week. So we are part of this uh, developing world that enjoys the, the kindness of the rich countries who share uh, their wealth to help us uh, fight COVID. And uh, we get also a, a vaccination campaign uh, ongoing. But so far, it's only 40,000 people in Laos who have uh, had a first shot. And how yeah. many people live in Laos? In What's Laos, we are only 7 million people. So, oh, okay. there, it's uh, the size of uh, Great Britain in size, in area. So, half of France and only one tenth of uh, France population here. 7 million. So, do you think they will keep the borders closed until everyone has been vaccinated? No, uh, they cannot wait that long because um, it's going to be way too far. Uh, the announcement, the official ones are saying that Laos wants to cover 20% of the population by the end of the year. It will be done, no problem, one million and a half people, something like that, it's going to be done. But it's not enough to get a herd immunity. So how much longer can we wait? Actually, because of the zero risk policy, we believe that the people here want to restart opening the borders with le less restrictions from the moment there's going to be an agreement on... Uh, passport vaccine, vaccine passport, you know, to show that you are vaccinated and, and, and things like that. So we believe that the only way that uh, it restarts is through vac vaccination from outside. And which which fa um, vaccines are they using? Are they using the Chinese one now? Uh, we use uh, everything here. We use Sinopharm, we use uh, Sputnik, 
And we just now started since last week to use AstraZeneca. So okay. we have... The reason I ask actually, is China just about two weeks ago launched their vaccine passport. Um, but at the moment, it's only for people who've had Chinese vaccine. Hopefully that will change. Um, and I'm sure that will change in the future, but for the time being. So that kind of rules out quite a lot of countries. But I think most of Asia um, have the Chinese vaccine accessible if they want it. Absolutely. And I, and, and I think that in the news, at least in France and wherever I read uh, the trade uh, news, uh, it's a big geopolitical debate because of uh, the relationship between China and Europe at the moment that are not so good. Uh, so it's a kind of way to say, yeah, we are open, but use our vaccine. But it's not allowed in Europe. <laughs> so how do you do? Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how it all pans out. And just to let you know, we've, we've had a few people... Um, comments saying they're really enjoying the uh, discussion but a few people are actually lecturers so we've got a lecturer from Egypt wow. another one from Nigeria and one from India so uh, we've got quite a Hello, everybody. audience here. Um, right so what was my next question um, so let's talk a little bit about B2B because um, I've seen this in your link profile anyone who's not familiar with what is it yes b2b is one way of doing business you have either the two main ways are either you do business directly with the travelers so it's called b2c business us to toward and seek customer so b2c is the most direct way to to visit and to enjoy some travel arrangements uh, you can find the clients like that uh, in the street. You can fly, find them online through a website, through blogs, forums, or, or whatever, indirect, without intermediary. And mm -hmm. B2B is business to business. So in that case, we work with travel professionals uh, who believe uh, in the potential of Laos for their clients, if they are uh, retailers or uh, tour operators as well. But for us, the way that I have developed uh, my portfolio of clients basically is more what I call producers. And for me, I work indifferently with tour operators who are going to wholesale to travel agents or uh, travel agents who are going to retail to the end travelers, people who are going to take care here in the destination. For me, it makes no sense to differentiate and I apply the same rule and care and rates to whoever is what I call a producer, but B2B professionals. Okay, interesting. Um, and you also mentioned um, luxury travel. So do you think there will be a bigger market for luxury travel post-COVID? Because um, that's something we've certainly seen here in China. As you, as you pointed out, the domestic tourism here in China is, is booming um, because you've got a lot of people who can't travel internationally, so they are traveling domestically instead. Um, but luxury travel specifically is doing very well. So do you think luxury travel will be something that will increase worldwide um, and in Lao, or do you think that will just be a temporary thing? I think so, but it takes some education because the luxury travelers, they hardly go B2C, they hardly go direct. They have no trust, they have no time, and they really trust their usual travel planners, no matter who they are, wherever they are. And uh, if you don't know a destination well, you will hardly promote it and sell it. So uh, the increase can only come from the familiarization of the destination, the knowledge of the destination, to push for sales, basically. And uh, in Laos, it's not what we are good at. There is no support from airlines to get discounted tickets for people to come and, and get familiar with it. So I hardly see how it's going to boom and boost uh, in terms of luxury travel. I don't think so. We have brands that, that believe in, in luxury travel because not long ago we had the... the um, opening of a Rosewood a small resort, like tented camp, you know, very luxury, $1,000 per room per night and everything, but it's limited to 20 rooms, you know? So very, very small size. We have also Belmont hotels, we have also Amman hotels. So we have ultra deluxe properties, but only limited to Rompabang basically. And the big challenge for luxury hotel is that we don't want them just to stick to Rompabang. It's nice, obviously, but we want them to go further. And so yeah. far, the, the quality of what is found outside of Rompabang is not matching. So people are afraid that something goes wrong or that the standard of the accommodation is not up to uh, their liking. But this is, to me, 
old fashioned uh, luxury. Today, luxury for me is not just about amenities and services in a hotel, it's much more. For me, luxury is about uh, experiencing the destination sincerely, where you have access to people and, and exclusive services that are beyond what anyone can reach, basically. And this we are happy to facilitate because in my seat, just all about that apply to groups and luxury apply to individuals. So mm -hmm. couples, families, or small group of friends. But um, uh, Laos is not yet renowned for being a luxury destination, I'm afraid, no. Okay, interesting. Um, so you've said lots about um, tourism in Laos and, and you've touched on your company. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about what your company does? Yes, we are specialists of uh, themed uh, tailor-made holidays. So when we started the company, I wanted to have fun myself because when you run a company, uh, it shouldn't be a burden every day to wake up. So we design what we like. And once we have the products, we go and chase the, the clients, B2B accounts. So for instance, we, I feel that to be successful, we need to speak the same language. And the language is the product. It's not a matter of uh, English, French, Spanish, Russian, Chinese language, not at all. We like to speak product and we develop our portfolio like that. So for instance, we go super niche. We go for tools that are appealing to ladies only or young ladies only, or for people who are looking for romance, like a, a wedding anniversary or honeymoons. Or, for instance, gourmet people who like to travel and explore the destination through the cuisine. So there are like communities that are identified here and there. And there are some specialist travel agents or tour operators. And we go proactively and knock at their inbox, knock at their profile on LinkedIn. And we try to engage in two talks and to uh, show them our know-how. And then we refine some products for, for their specific needs. And then they market it, and then we sell and operate it. So that's our way of working, going niche, because niche is product. And uh, being a specialist today is key to survival. If you are a generalist, you are going to be taken downwards uh, through the price uh, element. And we don't want to be a price-driven agency. We want to be as high as possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. OK. So you've talked about a few different types of tourism today. So if we have, because um, I know there are a few lecturers who like to share these videos with their students, especially if they're teaching anything in that area. So if anyone is sort of um, studying business tourism or, or rural tourism or long haul destinations or something like that, and they're sharing this video with their students, what advice would you give to anyone who might be interested in working in any of the areas you talked about today? So whether they're interested in working in lab or in business travel, mice travel specifically or luxury travel um get into the action go and find a, a, an interesting uh, training internship and and, and be uh, demanding ask to do things you, you just cannot be just an observer uh for me i learned pretty much everything on the spot i'm glad i did my master degree but uh, to be honest uh uh even though it was applied to CSR, outbound tourism from Europe and everything, I had some general knowledge, but I had no practical knowledge. So the best really is to find what is your passion. Uh, if you find your passion, it will be always uh, easy, I would say. So do whatever you like, but do it with passion. And uh, if you want to be successful, I think you also need to be ready for a plan B. Because in this world that from one minute to another, any uh, uh, travel possibility can disappear because if you rely on one source market and they stop their people to get out, if your country, your host country, stop them to coming in, then what happens? What do you do? How long is it going to take? We've been in uncertainty for, for, for one year already and we will be at least until the end of this year. So it's a long period of almost two years. And what shall we do? We were completely 100% reliant on, on foreigners. Now for us, we have had no choice than to refocus on where there is still a little bit of hope. And it's not a local domestic leisure market, it's on the group corporate market. So the mice that we know, we try to tweak it a little bit, the way we used to organize meetings for foreigners, the way we used to organize incentive trips for foreigners. We try to learn what is in demand here locally. And now since January, we are working on uh, 
yes, yeah, small tenders basically by companies and organizations that want to organize their annual retreat, their company uh, anniversary trip, their training uh, sessions or a mix of uh, training plus leisure. So we, we go corporate and we apply our mice techniques to the corporate local market. So be ready for, for, for a backup plan in case it goes wrong. For me, I could never imagine that I would be starved of business for more than one year. This is, nobody could anticipate that. But now the newcomers have no choice. You have to be ready for plan B. I think that's such a great point. And, and you know, this last year has highlighted that so much, hasn't it? That, you know, having backup plans and contingencies and just having the ability really to, to adapt to different situations is so important. And I think when you're, if you are a student and you're studying travel and tourism, it's really important that, that you do, you know, take part and, and listen to different things. I remember when I was at college, I hated studying marketing. It was my worst subject. I found it so dry, so dull. But now I, I wish I did a marketing degree because so much of what I do in my everyday work relates actually to marketing. And you just you don't know at the time where these things might be in the future. And I think it's so important to be open-minded and to... Very, very, very much so. And I have very good examples because a lot of my friends and peers and competitors in Laos and in the region, they were also, uh, like me, uh, volunteers, you know, foreigners living in Cambodia, in Vietnam or whatever. And when they had no more salary, when they had no more revenue, basically, and all their savings were running low, they left the, the region and they returned to Spain, UK, France, Germany or whatever. And most of them, actually, even though they are in their 30s, 40s or whatever, they took some online classes to get some new like certifications, diploma or credits or whatever, because uh, uh, reinventing yourself is an absolute necessary necessity. So there is no edge to keep learning. Uh, as long as you what you learn, uh, do a good use of it, uh, whatever it is. Uh, like you said, marketing, digital marketing, uh, coaching or, or, or whatever. <laughs> yeah. And there's so many more opportunities now as well with everything or with so many things becoming digital and, and moving online. Um, you know, I think stu the student of today has so many more opportunities than we would have had. I mean, oh, yes. when I did my master's degree, I, I couldn't go to work on those days. I had to take day, you know, I, I worked 0.5 um, mm. at a college at the time and, and on the other two and a half days I was studying for my master's and it just there, there are so many more opportunities today that people can do it in the evenings they can do it distance learning and there are so many courses you can even study at a, a university when you're not in the country which is amazing absolutely so, yeah. managing time difference also you know we are in Asia and uh, anything that happens in the morning in Europe is great for us because you can have a daytime occupation maybe a small job on the side and learn uh, in the afternoon or evening so there's always Hello. Hello, hello. 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 Can you hear me? Hello. Hello. It's back. It's back. You can cut. Two seconds. <laughs> is, uh, in here in China, the four G is incredible. Um, but the Wi-Fi, not so much. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think we'll probably need to wrap it up there. Is there anything else you'd like to add before we finish? Um, no, let's not lose the hope. There's going to be a, a future and uh, it's going to be perhaps different, I hope, a little bit. 
slower, more responsible, more meaningful. I think uh, so. um, but finding your way is also important. Uh, travel, tourism, hospitality, services industry, all of that is really interconnected. And uh, doing things with passion is, is, is a must. Uh, we will hardly be rich uh, in the travel business, in the tourism industry. But uh, if it's not a burden already, it's, it's, a, it's a big win. So today, uh, feeling good in your head uh, with the people who matter around you, this is really the, the most important, I would say. For me, uh, I'm happy to be living here in Laos, surrounded by people who care about me, that I care about. And uh, no matter the, the, the challenge, uh, we do things we like, surrounded by uh, people who have the same values. So it's important also to talk about values with your stakeholders inside your company or the company you work for, your clients, your suppliers, everybody. Uh, I hope that the future will be led by, uh, by kind uh, people, I would say, uh, respectful of the local host communities, of the environment and all of that. Uh, this is the, the way to go. Huh? Uh, it was the case in the past. It will be even more uh, in the future. Yeah, well, that's, that's a good positive note to end on. Thank you so much, Laurent. Um, it's been really interesting to talk to you. Um, and next week at the same time, so uh, it will be 4 p.m. because the China time, because the clock is in the UK, 9 a.m. next Wednesday, 31st of March. Our ne the next person to talk will be Charlotte Lauman. We're going to be talking about the Koyan tribe in Thailand, which I'm sure you we know a little bit about. Um, Thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, so we're going to be talking about the human zoo and the Kayan tribes. So it'll be a really interesting case study to look at and, and Charlotte will be really good work in that area. So if you are interested, please do um, tune in next week. And thank you so much again. It's been a pleasure speaking to you. Likewise. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your night or day, wherever you are on the planet. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Take care.